Thanks to a hobbyist in Luxembourg, I can now run the first version of the first operating system that ran on the first disk systems supplied by Southwest Technical for their 6800 line of computers. That first disk system was the MF68, and the operating, they, operating system they shipped with it, at least for the first six to nine months or so, was called FDOS. And that's what we're going to take a look at today. We're going to uh, use FDOS and we're going to learn a little bit more about the early history of floppy drives on Southwest technical computers. Now back in the second half of 1976, a couple things came together that really kick-started the rapid growth in the use of floppy disks in the personal computer marketplace. One of those was the introduction of the five and a quarter inch mini disk drive that you see here. This was introduced by Shugart and this is their SA400, their first mini disk drive. As you can see, it's smaller and lighter than the big 8-inch drives, and it was also substantially less expensive. And as you expect, these characteristics all appeal to the personal computer marketplace. The second thing that happened is that a company came along that pulled together hardware and software to make it easy and affordable to add a floppy disk system to the personal computers of the day. About one-third the cost of what a, uh, a typical 8-inch floppy system cost to add. And that company was called North Star Computers. They provided a disk controller. This is the disk controller from North Star right here. This is for an S100 computer. Uh, they provided a couple of the um, S100, excuse me, a couple of the Shugart drives with a uh, cabinet that had a power supply in it. And then they also provide an operating system called North Star DOS that made it easy to start using the floppy disk with your computer system. Now it's hard to call North Star DOS an operating system. It does really little more than duplicate the ability of cassette or paper tape to load and save programs and allows you to do it on your disk drive. And that's about all it could do. However, the disk, floppy disk could do that so much faster and so much more reliable than paper tape or cassette. And you could use file names instead of tape counters that it really caught on. And obviously the floppy disk was a huge um, wave of purchasing after that. Now, unfortunately for Southwest users, um, they obviously couldn't use this S100 version from um, Northstar, and Southwest wouldn't provide a disk system for the 6800 computer for about another year after this. And so as you might expect during that year, Southwest Technical lost a lot of momentum and market share because people went to S100 computers because they wanted floppy disk drives. And to make matters worse, Southwest did not take that year and leapfrog the competition with better hardware and or software when they finally did come out with it. Instead, they pretty much duplicated what Northstar had done here, both hardware and software wise, a full year earlier. So yes, Southwest was now shipping disk drives and an operating system. However, it was still about a year behind the current technology of what was going on in the S100 marketplace. So. Um, that was really kind of the beginning of the end for Southwest when they got behind on the disk drives and never really could catch up with the S100 side of the marketplace. All right, I'm going to do a video cut and set this up to uh, run FDOS and we'll take a look and see what it's like to use the first operating system supplied with the uh, MF68 disk drive cabinet. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the drive cabinet that came with the MF68 system. However, that drive cabinet was nothing but two SA400 drives inside a metal box with a power supply, which is exactly what I have here. So this cabinet is completely equivalent to what came with the MF68. The system also shipped with a DC1 disk controller that installed in the IO bus in the back of the 6800 computer. I have that same controller and it's installed. And then of course it also came with an FDOS disk to allow you to boot and run and use the disk drives. So I'm gonna go ahead and install that here and drive to zero. I'm going to go ahead and run two disks today, so we'll put a disk in drive one, two, so we can see it operate with uh, two drives instead of just one. Now, in order to boot a disk operating system, there's typically a boot ROM or a monitor ROM somewhere that allows you to load a boot sector off the disk and start the boot process. On that Northstar disk controller we saw previously, it actually had boot ROMs right on the controller. So when you bought that, you just jumped to an address on the card and it just worked. That made it very simple, like I said, for the end user to install the floppy system on their computer. However, we can't do that with the DC1 and the 6800 computer because we can't have EEPROM back on the I.O. bus in the 6800. Now, we do have a monitor ROM in here. It's called Micbug, but Micbug is a Motorola product and it would know nothing about this disk drive, so that won't work. So when this product was introduced in August of 77, Southwest also introduced a new monitor ROM. 
They called it Swap Bug or SWT Bug. For the most part, it was backward compatible with MicBug, kept most of all the commands, kept key entry points from that monitor ROM, but it added several new commands and capabilities, one of which, of course, is a disk boot command. And I have Swap Bug installed in this machine, so to boot, all I have to do is type D. I need uppercase D, and it boots over there. You can see it coming up on drive zero. And it's up and running. It doesn't take long at all. Go ahead and watch things on this monitor for most of the time now. All right, um, very few commands in this. One of them is, however, a catalog command that gets you a quick look at what's on the disk. More detailed look is with the files command. And this breaks down, you can see the disk organization here. For example, um, here's basic. It starts on track three, sector five. It's 23 hex sectors long. Loads at 100, runs through 23FF. The starting address when you want to jump to it and execute it is 100. This column here is a file type to distinguish system files, executable files, basic files, that kind of thing. All right, now a file on this system um, is a contiguous group of sectors. Sectors are 256 bytes each, and the file has to be pre-created to be as big as you think you'll ever need it to be in all contiguous sectors. You can go from one track to another, though. Um, the problem would be, let's say you need to grow the file a little bit bigger. Your source file gets bigger, or your basic program gets bigger. All you could do is create a new file out here in free space at the end of the disk, bigger, and delete your original file. Um, you can't reuse that space, it just becomes a hole. And eventually you'll have several holes in the disk, um, and that's what this pack utility you see here is for. What it does is it moves everything back to the front of the disk so that all your free space is then at the end of the disk again. This is exactly like North Star DOS. Every bit of this is exactly the same. All right, um, so what this DOS really gives you the ability to do is load a program from disk into memory or save memory out to disk. And that's really all this does. So let's take a look at this. I have a demo program here. This is the same demo in some of these other videos, just a little program I wrote. It's out there on disk at sector or track 13, sector three, and it's two sectors long. It's gonna load into at address 100 and its execution address is 100. So to load and execute a program, you just type run and then the file name. It loads it into memory and jumps to it. Now we're running my program. How many times do we want to display that? Let's say seven times. It displays it seven times. And I had it jump back right into FDOS's main loop. I know I did not clobber FDOS in memory, um, therefore I was safe to jump right back into it. Now FDOS is up at 2400 hex, um, kind of keeping itself in the 12K boundary, somewhere around there. Um, kind of in the middle of things really, but that's the way North Star DOS was as well. All right, you don't have to run it, you can also just load it. So for example, if I type load demo, that pulls it into memory, but doesn't actually execute it. I can exit to swap bug, and it preloaded A048 for me. If you remember, that's the jump to address. So now I could execute go, and it, uh, you can see that it still works. Um, the main reason you'd want to do that is when you had something that didn't fit in one file because it was spread out in different addresses. For example, you might load uh, basic and then turn around and load a disk file that it's going to access that you want somewhere else in memory. And I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. All right, saving to memory is very similar to what I've done here. I've got the demo program in memory right now. To save it, um, you can just say save. Let's call it demo2. It's going to starting address 100, ending address 7F, start address 100. And you'll see it created. Now you notice it did it two sectors instead of one. That's because when you use the save command, it allocates about 25% extra uh, space to allow it to grow a bit. Obviously this small uh, file, you, you don't have the granularity to do an even 25%. Now, if you wanted a file to be a guaranteed size, you would use the create command uh, instead, and that would make it a fixed size. So I could create demo three, and I want it to be just one sector long. So it's empty right now. Demo three is empty. Now I can save to it, because I still have demo in memory, so I can save demo. Uh, I don't want to save demo, I want to save demo three. 
how do you abort this? Well, that's no good, is it? All right, well, I'm gonna end up having to save demo itself anyway. I wonder if I can type something bad, nope. No easy way out of this one. All right, so that's save demo again. But what I wanted to do is save demo three and show you that it does not end up growing the file. All right, you'll see that demo three still remains one hex byte. I mean, one sector long. And it still works. All right. Um, you notice some files with dollar signs in front of them. Those are considered system files. Those will run just by typing the name of the file. You don't have to type run in the file name. So if I want to load basic and run it, I can just type basic. It's a big program. It takes a while to run, to load. And now we're inside basic. And uh, let's see, basic can uh, load, pop, load files and uh, save files. This is a disk basic that's aware of it. This is Southwest Technicals basic, the one that keeps all uh, numbers in decimal with nine digits of precision. You can go back to DOS with the DOS command. Let's take a look over on drive one. Here we have a bunch of basic programs. The 5.5 in the type code is, is the basic program. I'm gonna go ahead and load uh, calendar. So let me go back to basic. Now, technically, BASIC was still in memory. I could have exited to SWATBUG and then just jumped to BASIC. Unfortunately, uh, um, FDOS doesn't give you a jump to an address command like, uh, like Northstar DOS did. All right, so now let's load. And to load from a different file, you put the, I mean, drive, you put the drive number with a comma and then the file name. And you can see the calendar programs in here now. and you are up and running. All right. Also on this disk is CoRes, that's the co-resident uh, assembler editor. So the, the editor in this is basically just like using basic. I mean, you can say 10, I could say print hello, or print H. It's in there, but that's, of course, not valid assembler. So the editor you use just like you were typing in basic programs. So I have a file out there called demo s. Um, this is the uh, source code for our demo program. Now you'll notice it's not pretty with tabs. That's because they recommend saving space that you don't put in spaces or tabs, just use uh, a single space. This was done a lot in the old days. So this is now in your uh, edit buffer and you want to assemble it. You go to the assembler and you manually run the two passes. This was not unusual in the early days of the Motorola assembler. So, oops, 1P runs first pass, that generates the symbol table. And then second pass with an L just generates a listing. So here you can see your program. Now 2T would punch it out the tape. Um, 2P would do a listing and punch it out the tape. And on the disk version, when you punch it out the tape, it actually creates a file. However, that does not work. It just crashes the system. I've run multiple versions of CoRes, and I've yet to figure out why. So something's wrong. I don't know what yet. But um, normally you would run 2T or 2P, and it asks you to create a file, which it does. But then it, it just crashes. So as of yet, I can't actually assemble an object file on this uh, you can see it's got me in Never Never Land already. So herein lies the reality of this operating system. It's very easy to end up in Never Never Land. It's very easy to screw things up and screw files up. Um, not very robust at all in terms of user protection. All right, let's run one other thing. I have a different uh, basic on here to demonstrate how somebody who had just gotten this and had programs that they've been using on paper tape and cassette, you could just load those and easily get them here on the disk. So this is uh, from a company called TSC. It's called Micro Basic. It was a really good, roughly 4K basic or so. Um, and it would normally run load from paper tape or cassette, but I loaded it into memory and was able to save it to disk. And so now I can just run it, TSC Micro Basic, um, just as if I loaded it from tape or cassette. But of course, this is just way quicker. Uh, exclamation point is the, uh, um, 
command prompt here. Um, but even though this is a um, basic that does know, knows nothing about this disk, all it knows about is paper, tape, and cassette, you could still use it without having to buy anything else. Let's write a little program. All right, so let's say you wanted to save it. Now this program is designed to work with a monitor and paper tape uh, with swap bug or mic bug. So you type mon, you're back into swap bug. And if you remember from the old, old videos at A002 through A005, um, that's the address range that you want to punch to tape. This basic is very nice for you and it sets those addresses up with the start of the program and the end of the program so you know exactly what the memory bounds are, 0D4D through 0D75 of the program in memory. So now, knowing that, I can jump back to FDOS, 2611 is the command loop, and I can save, um, let's call this uh, demo.b, and I know it's from 0D4D to 0D75. Program start doesn't make any difference because it doesn't actually execute. All right, so this demo B, it saved it for us out there and it knows where to load it. All right, so let's go back to that program. Now it's exit, there we go. To, uh, convention was uh, like 100 would be the start of the program and 103 would be a warm start. So at this point, everything's still in here. I can scratch that and now everything's gone. All right, so let's say I just loaded basic and now I wanna load that program. All I have to do is go back to the FDOS, and our program is that demo B. I can just do load demo B. It puts it into memory right there where um, the micro basic expects it. So now I just jump back into micro basic, and the program's there. So even though it knows nothing about disk drives, the fact that you can load and save memory, these old programs that ran from tape and paper cassette that used basically just loading and saving from memory, this works quite well for that. All right, frankly, that, that's about it. That's about all you can do. Uh, there is a copy command that is used to copy an entire disk to another disk. So um, you can back up disk, but you can't copy individual files. There is a rename command. So yeah, I can rename a file. And there's a delete command, purge, like demo two, purge demo three. And now if you look, you'll see the holes. And then if you then run pack, it will move demo in and our free space will be at the end. But anyway, that's really about all that operating system could do. The only way to copy files would be to go into basic, load the program and then save it off to another spot or a different name or go into the assemb assembler and do that with a source file. Copy an executable, you have to load it into RAM and then save it from RAM back to another name. So. Uh, very primitive, basically got the job done. But um, when Flex came along for this, about uh, six to nine months after this was first introduced, about um, April, May or so of, uh, of 1978, this came out in August of 77, we started shipping Flex 1.0. Um, Flex 1.0 was also known as Mini Flex, and you've seen Flex demoed in another video. And it's, it's a lot like CPM. So a dramatic improvement over this, just like CPM was a dramatic improvement over trying to use Northstar DOS. I mean, everybody went to CPM after uh, it came out versus Northstar DOS or some of the early DOSes. Same here, this FDOS didn't stay around. It, it made it up to version 1.4, I think I saw in, in some uh, comments somewhere. But uh, after that, it kind of died out and Flex was the answer in the 6800 world from then on. All right, well, that does it for this video. And, um, don't really have any other new ideas for 6800, but I'm sure something will come up and uh, we'll start this um, thread up again in the future.